Alright guys, welcome back to Revive School. Here we are, 1 Kings 13 and 14. We are transitioning into what we would call chaos. It's almost like not quite as bad as the book of Judges, but it's going to feel like that. It's going to feel like evil killing, evil killing. Oh, there's a good person. Evil killing, evil killing. Like that's kind of the mentality. Now remember, in 1 Kings 11, this is the death of Solomon. Solomon is dead. Now we have new players coming into the picture. You have Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Okay, this is the, 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 and remember, it went from one king to two kings. You have one king over all of Israel. Okay, Jeroboam was in charge of 10 tribes. And then you have Rehoboam in charge of one tribe. But in your mind, you have to think two tribes. Okay, that's kind of the mentality to the equal 12. That's where we're going today. Everybody on the same page? I feel like we should probably, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> yeah, well, I'll start writing here in a little bit. We might have some drawings today. Just for the record, we might have some fun drawings today. 1 Kings 13, this is where we're at. Okay, now I want you to understand something. Jeroboam, right, he was the servant, right, of Solomon, right? Jeroboam walked into a prophet giving him a brand new jacket but then tearing it up saying, ha ha, you know, but you're going to get the 10 and then you're not going to get the one, okay, the two pieces. That, that's what it looks like. So when you think of 1 Kings 13, like you think of 1 Kings 11, 1 Kings 11 was all about Solomon and his issues, Solomon and his sin. That's really what 1 Kings 13 is about with Jeroboam. Jeroboam has issues. We talk about an old prophet. We're talking about a man of God. But all of it is because of Jeroboam. Remember how Jeroboam walked into the scenario because of Solomon's issues? Like he just walked into it. It's the same for the other scenarios. So just giving you a backdrop, a lot about this is about Jeroboam uh, and his sins. Okay, and so we are in 1 Kings 13 today. Here's what you're going to have in the first two verses. And I, you know, Wearsby to me, uh, you know, we took a dry spell from using Wearsby for a while, right? I haven't even talked about him for a long time. But there's something about in Kings, I really like Warren Wearsby's perspectives. Simple, it's clean. And so what you're going to have is you're going to have a message, okay? In the first two verses, and it says this, A man of God came from Judah to Bethel by revelation from the Lord. In other words, this man of God clearly heard, okay, I need to come to this place because he has a revelation from the Lord while Jeroboam was standing beside the altar to burn incense. That already right there is a big no-no, okay? Just so you have an understanding, Jeroboam chose in this, just in this verse, not only play king, but to also play priest. Yes, that's not how it's wired. Jeremiah and Ezekiel, they played priests and prophets. But you are not ever to see a king function as a priest until later, meaning the coming Messiah. But if you would, I mean, just in 2 Chronicles, you don't have to go there, Kevin. In 2 Chronicles 26, uh, 16 through 23, it's not allowed. A king and a priest, it's not allowed. You have different roles, different functions. And so right away in verse 1, there's a message. This man of God has a revelation from the Lord, and he's going to come and present this. So in verse 2, the man of God, seven times you're going to see that reference. The man of God, he, cry, he doesn't even have a name, by the way. The man of God, which I think probably would be the coolest titles. Nobody knew your name, but like, hey, hello. You know, that's so funny. I always get a voicemail message every two weeks. Hello, this is the man of God. And then he promotes his local church. But then he also says his name. So it's a little awkward that he calls himself. So anyway, the man of God cried out <laughs> against the altar by a revelation from the Lord. So the man of God has a word revelation from the Lord and he releases it. Altar, altar. This is what the Lord says. A son will be born to the house of David named Josiah and he will sacrifice on you the priests of the high places who are burning incense on you. Human bones will be burned on you. Now, Josiah eventually is going to come and rule Judah. Think about this. He's going to rule Judah about 300 years later. <laughs> and he's actually going to come in and slaughter, how about this one, the illegitimate priests. Like, that's how he's going to play a role. Josiah is going to come in. So the prophecy is actually going to take place. In fact, can you go there, Kevin? 2 Kings 23, 15 through 20. Okay. The reason I want to say this is because here you have a man of God. He clearly hears from the word. Now look at this. Okay, It says in verses 15 through 20, it says he tore down the altar at Bethel, the high place at, at Jeroboam. Look at that. He tore down the high places at Jeroboam 
who had caused Israel to sin, had made. Then he burned the high place, crushed it to death, burned the Asherah. Then Jos as Josiah turned, he saw the tombs there on the mountain. He sent somebody to take the bones of the tombs. He burned them on the altar. He defiled it according to the word of the Lord, proclaimed by the man of God who proclaimed these things. How awesome is this? Then he said, what is this monument I see? The men of the, him, of the city said, it's the tomb of the man of God who came from Judah and proclaimed these things that you've done to the altar at Bethel. Verse 18, so he said, let him rest. Don't let anybody disturb his bones. So they left his bones undisturbed with the bones of the prophet. We'll talk about that, who came from Samaria. Verse 19, uh, Josiah also removed all of the shrines of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel had made to provoke the Lord. Josiah did the same things to them that he had done at Bethel. And then it continues on and it continues on. Obviously in 20, it says he slaughtered on the altars all the priests of the high places who were there and he burned human bones on the altars. Then he returned to Jerusalem. Now look, this is 2 Kings 23. Now we're in 1 Kings 13. This man of God, hears a revelation, right? And it says he came from Judah and he came to Bethel. Okay. Interesting enough, okay, about Bethel. Bethel, a lot of people would even say, like this is a place where a lot of people came to learn about functioning as prophets. They even thought maybe there was even a school there, which I think is really interesting when in America you actually have a school called Bethel and they obviously teach in the gift of prophecy whether you agree or don't agree with them. That's not the point of the discussion. That, that's the correlation to, to maybe what we're talking about. Maybe what we're talking about. So I just, I think that's really cool that here a man of God came to Bethel. He had a word from the Lord. He spoke it into King Jeroboam. And he basically called him out. You can't be doing this. And in verse three, he says, he gave a sign that day. And he said, this is the sign that the Lord has spoken. The altar will now be ripped apart and the ashes that are on it will be poured out. Then in verse four, you know, yeah, then in verse four, then we're going to get into verses four through six. You go from a message, right? To the miracles. So when the king heard the word that the man of God had cried out against the altar of Bethel, in other words, he called him out. Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar when he was doing things he shouldn't have been done doing, and he said, arrest him. <laughs> but the hand he stretched out against him withered, and he couldn't pull it back to himself. Verse 5, that would be awful. The altar was ripped apart. The ashes poured from the altar according to the sign that the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And so it says in verse 6 of 1 Kings 13, then the king responded to the man of God after he realizes, oh no, my arm is withered. I can't pull it back. And he says, plead for the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me so that my hand may be restored. And so this is crazy to me. The man of God pleaded for the favor of the Lord and the king's hand was restored to him and it became as it had been at first, like nothing had happened. So he delivers a message, a revelation from the Lord. Miracle actually takes place. Miracles take place. In other words, it happened and then it returned. That's why we have miracles. And then scripture just continues on. Then the king, this is kind of interesting, this is what Wearsby has here, and I'll see if I spell it right. He creates, he has a, a maneuver role. <laughs> so then the king declared to the man of God, come home with me, refresh yourself, and I'll give you a reward. In other words, I, I heard that word that you just said. I really don't want anybody else to hear this. I don't want others to embrace this. Why don't you come on to my house? And I, you know what? We'll just act like it didn't happen. I'll, I'll give you a reward. <laughs> But the man of God replied, if you're to give me half your house, I don't know why he'd want half of his house, but he works on his negotiating skills. That's like me when I first got married. Have you heard about my negotiating skills? We were going to go buy a, a, um, a table, you know, and some chairs. And uh, I was like, I don't even remember the price, but it was like, you know, I was like, you know, I'll give you, you know, $100 or $200 for this. The guy's like, sold, $200. I was like, my dad's like, you're never negotiating ever again. You know, like this is like, if you were to give me half your house or, or whole, all of your house, I still wouldn't go with you and I wouldn't eat bread or drink water in this place. In verse nine, for this, look at this, is what I, this is what I was commanded by the word of the Lord. You must not eat bread or drink water or go back the way you came. If you have a meal with King Jeroboam that you just released a word, you're living in sin. What are you saying by having a fellowship, by having a meal with him? Yeah, it's okay. I'm in alignment with actually your type of worship. I'm in alignment with your false worship to these idols and, and doing things that are not of, of God. And so, and in fact, I can't even go back the way I came. 
This is how radical it is. I need to release the word and it says I need to go a different way. So like all of this has to change. And so in verse 10, he went another way. He did not go back by the way he had come to Bethel. So right now, everything has happened according to the Lord, right? I mean, I think this is really a cool story. A, a prophet hears the word. He releases it for the king. The king doesn't like it. He tries to, you know, sucker him in and, and woo him into this and feed him and it doesn't work. And, and the prophet is like, yes, I did my job. And then in verse 11, what you're going to see, 11 through 34, is what Wearsby says is a mistake. <laughs> You know, he's, he simplifies the whole thing. I love that. Uh, message, miracles, maneuver, and mistake. Yeah, I got the M's going on today. Now, a certain old man. So I love this. It's like the no-name chapter. Man of God, men of God. And then a certain old prophet was living in Bethel, right? And so remember, he, he went a different way. So Bethel was where he was at. That's where the man of God was at. You got to understand that. So he was living in Bethel, okay? And his son came. And he told him all the deeds that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. His sons also told that their father, the words that had, he had spoken to the king. So the sons released everything. Word spread quickly in Bethel. And in verse 12, then their father said to them, which way did he go? His sons had seen the way taken by the man of God who had come from Judah. Verse 13, scripture just says this. Then he said to his son, saddle up the donkey. So they saddled the donkey for him and he got on it. So old prophet gets on a donkey and he gets in and he's getting ready to find the man of God. The man of God is going a different way. Verse 14, he followed the man of God and found him sitting under an oak tree. He asked him, hey, you the man of God who came from Judah? <laughs> hey, I am. That's me. I'm the man of God. No, he doesn't say that. He says, I am. Then he said to him, come home with me and eat bread. Old prophet on a donkey. Come on with me. Come eat bread. Verse 16. Now remember, what did he tell the king? I can't do that. I have to go home a different way. Can't eat bread. Can't drink water with anybody. But he said, I can't go back with you. Eat bread or drink water with you in this place. For a message came to me by the word of the Lord. This man of God knows what he heard. You must not eat bread or drink water there or go back by the way you came. You just, you can't. In verse 18, he said to him, I am also a prophet like you. This is the old prophet now. An angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord. Bring him back with, with bring him back with you to your house so that he may eat bread and drink water. <laughs> Enter creepy music. The old prophet deceived him. I mean, that's what's happening. Totally is what's taking place. And so in verse, here we go. And the man of God went back with him. Change of story. He ate bread in his house and he drank water in verse 19. I don't know. It's so weird to me how, how all of this happens. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk through... Um, a little bit about at the end about the bigger picture behind this. But, you know, why the deception? Why is the old man? What, what does the old man care? It goes back to what we were saying. Maybe, just maybe, maybe MacArthur says his own sons were worshipers at Bethel or perhaps the, pri the priests. And they were actually encouraging King Jer Jeroboam. Like there's a chance his sons were tied into this worship. May maybe the old prophet wanted to gain favor with the king by showing up the man of God as an imposter who came in to release a word, but the old prophet really knows better. Like there's all kinds of weird motives that people do in the religious community for themselves. Can you go to Jeremiah 23, 16? This old prophet is coming up with, uh, it's a lie, 100% a lie. And he said, but at this point, we don't really, we, we do know because it says he deceived him. We just don't know why. And Jeremiah 23, 16 says, this is what the Lord of hosts says. Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They are making you worthless. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the Lord's mouth. What I want to get into at the end, okay, I'm going to practically walk through this. How do you know this is from the Lord? When people approach you, when people give you words, how do you know this is up from, uh, from the Lord? So we're going to walk through that, okay? So just know that this is one of the backdrops. And then in Ezekiel 13, verse 2, Ezekiel 13, verse 2, again, uh, this false prophet was releasing a word. Okay, Ezekiel 13, uh, verse 2. Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who are prophesying. Say to those who prophesy, look at this, out of their own imagination, hear the word of the Lord. And then in verse 7, 
This would just support this a little bit farther. Didn't you see a false vision and speak a lying divination when you were proclaimed, this is the Lord's declaration, even though I had not spoken? That's exactly what happened from an old prophet to a man of God. And in verse 20, <laughs> uh, let's go back, Kevin, if you can, yeah. So in verse 20, it says this. So while they're sitting at the table, ah, oh, this is great food, thanks, right? You know, the word of the Lord came to the prophet. That's, this is the old prophet, right? The one who deceived the man of God. So wait, what? A word of the Lord now came to the prophet who had a false prophecy? Now an actual word is coming to the old prophet? Yes. You want to know why people are confused? Yes. <laughs> I mean, come on. In verse 21, it says, And the prophet cried out, this is the pro old prophet, cried out to the man of God. It would have been easier if they had names, just for the record, at this point. The old prophet cried out to the man of God who had come from Judah. This is what the Lord says. Because you rebelled against the command of the Lord and did not keep the command that the Lord, God, Lord your God commanded you. Like you weren't supposed to eat, right? But you went back and ate bread and drank water in the place that he said to you, do not eat bread and drink water. Your corpse will never reach the grave of your fathers. Like this is, this is ultimately the, the worst thing. It's a disgrace. Like the Israelites truly buried their dead, uh, their dead with the bones of the ancestors in a common grave. Like you want to be with your family. And so for this, you're, you're, you're basically saying it's, it's not necessarily maybe a curse, but a disgrace. And so then it says in verse 23, after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk, the old prophet saddled the donkey for the prophet as he had brought back. Okay, so it continues on. When he left, okay, go back to verse 23. Okay, I just want to make sure everybody understands who's who if we can. Verse 23. So after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk, the old prophet saddled the donkey for the prophet. That prophet is the man of God. I just want to make sure everybody understands. So the man of God that he had brought back, this man of God is now on a donkey. Okay, so now he's on a donkey. He was walking before. Now in verse 24. So the man of God is now on a donkey and a lion attacked him along the way and killed him. So the man of God was now killed by a lion. His corpse was thrown on the road and then the donkey that he was on was standing beside it and the lion was standing beside the corpse. Great picture over here. Here you have the man of God was on the donkey Lion comes, kills him, and now both animals randomly stare at him with his mouth open. There were men, then it says in verse 25, passing by who saw the corpse thrown on the road and the lion standing beside it. And like they're staring at the lion. Does anybody else find it weird that there's just a lion on the road and they went and they spoke about it? Hey, did you, did you see the lion next to the dead body and the donkey? It says they spoke about it in the city where the old prophet lived. Verse 26. When the prophet who had brought him back, this is the old prophet, this is the alive prophet, from his way heard about it, he said, he is the man of God who disobeyed the command of the Lord. The Lord had given him to the lion and it has mauled and killed him according to the word of the Lord that he spoke to him. So the old prophet says, yeah, he got what he deserved. Oh my. Verse 27, I just, I, who doesn't love this story? It's so confusing and so exciting. So then the old prophet says, saddle the donkey. <laughs> Everybody's riding donkeys. They saddled it in verse 28. And he went and found the corpse of the man of God thrown on the road with the donkey and the lion standing beside the corpse. Whose issue is all of this? This is Jeroboam's. This is all because of Jeroboam and his sin and false worship. The man of God releases the word. A, a false prophet releases a word. And the next thing you know, the false prophet gets a real word. And then that real word then speaks into the man of God who bought into this deception. And now the man of God is dead on the side of the road. It's super messy. And by the way, the animals are just staring at him. The lion had not eaten the corpse or mauled the donkey. This is a weird, weird phrase, but Warren Wearsby says this, and I really like this. These animals actually acted unnatural at this point. Maybe... It was because the beasts bent their wills to the Lord. It's just a thought. The Lord had clearly set up the situation in which this man did not do. It's a thought. It's an interesting perspective. And so here you have, right? It says in verse 29, Kevin, if we can, the prophet lifted the corpse of the man of the God, man of God, and he laid it on the donkey. This donkey has <laughs> got to be utterly confused. Like what just happened? 
And then he brought it back. And the old prophet came into the city to mourn and to bury him. It's almost like now the false prophet who became a real prophet, it's almost like he has a conscience now. Like, I feel bad. I gave him a word and now he's dead. And now I told him he's not going to hang out with his fathers who are dead. I'm going to take care of him. So he grabbed, I feel like I'm going <laughs> to. So he brings him back to bury him in verse 30. If you only knew just what went through my head. Then he laid the corpse in his own grave. And then they, they, they mourn saying, oh, my brother. So man of God dead. Now with old prophet in his grave. Old prophet's still alive. Man of God is dead. Okay, verse 31. After he had bur buried him, he said to his sons, when I die, you must bury me in the grave where the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the word that he cried out by a revelation from the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the shrines of the high places in the cities of Samaria is certain to happen. It was like... Uh, it was almost like, you guys, when he realized how right and accurate the man of God was. It was almost like, again, I'm, I'm totally going to just, in my Kyle mind, this says, I'm not going to say this is 100% accurate, okay? I'm just sounding out something. In my mind, when people are in sinful situations, and then people come in and they reveal the truth, and they don't like the truth, they'll do whatever they can to manipulate the truth. And it felt like this old prophet was truly caught for some, it felt like his lifestyle was endorsing King Jeroboam's sin. And so he's going to fix it so that he can truly not go back, uh, to, to not live like the man of God, but the way he wanted to keep living. It might have impacted his kids, it might have impacted his family. And that in the process, it was like the conscience kicked back in and he realized what he had done. And he realized, look, I need to take care of this guy because that's, that's really going to happen. And so I wonder if even if the old prophet just started to back away from everything that was taking place there. Meanwhile, lives are completely a mess. Families are destroyed. And then in verse 33, after all of this, <laughs> lion, donkey, man of God, old prophet, Jeremiah did not repent of his evil way. But again, set up priests for the high places from every class of people. He ordained whoever so desired it, and they became priests of the high places. And then in verse 34, this was a sin that caused the house of Jeroboam to be wiped out and annihilated from the face of the earth. So Jeremiah, his sins, and guess how it ends? His sins. Jeroboam, it ended with Jeroboam. It started with Jeroboam's sins and it ended with his sins. And you know, in, in 1 Kings 14, Jeroboam's son then dies, just so you guys know. And then again, it has this process of Ahijah prophesies over Jeroboam. Jeroboam dies. Nadab succeeds Jeroboam. Uh, and then Jerusalem is raided. Rehoboam of uh, King of Judah dies. Like it's this back and forth, back and forth. One dies, new son enters. One dies, new son enters. Okay, that's 1 Kings 14. But what do you, what do, you do with all of this? I want to just walk through, I mean, I, I think for me, uh, like we have to learn to trust the voice of God in our lives. We can't let others speak for him. We have to be able to discern, uh, like, he's our primary source. And everything that you and I must do, he must be our filter, not necessarily the humans. God can use humans. And so all I want to do is, uh, I don't know if I'm going to write this. I don't have time. I, I, I'll do a quick one here. I just want to give you, and Craig Simons, Greg Simons, I love what he does, ways to confirm God's voice. Okay, just simple, ways to confirm God's voice. Okay, number one, right, does it agree, I mean, this is simple, with the Bible. Okay, just number one, when you hear a word from the Lord, somebody says something, does it agree with the Bible? Okay, I have verses for all this, but I just want to give you a, a big picture here. Number two, what you hear from the Lord, will it make me more like Christ. Okay, again, these sound obvious, but you just need affirmation in this process. So here's another one. Does my spouse, okay, or family, I'll just say that, and that's a little bit different. Does my spouse or family confirm it? 
like, man, you're totally off your rocker. Sometimes you have to do that. You have to go against your family. So like this one's a little bit different, you know, like because scripture says sometimes your family's going to hate you. But just does your spouse, I mean, your spouse better be on the same page. Otherwise, if you get into this whole unequally yoked thing, it's totally not going to work. What about other believers? Do other believers confirm it? You know, I think I'm supposed to sell my eight vehicles and my house. What do other people think? You know, do they discern that? You know, and here's a, here's a cool one. Is it consistent with, I think this is an interesting one, with how God made me? You know, like, is it building up in what and how we've been wired? Like, Kevin, you've been doing things in your life for this. Like, has been God taking, you know, Rich in all of these seasons to get ready for this? Like, is this consistent with how God has made me to do the things that I'm supposed to be doing? You know, number six, does it line up with, and again, there's different ways to hear the Lord's voice. Does it line up with prophetic words spoken over you? So like, you know, if you're hearing something from the Lord, and you're wondering, is this of the Lord? Maybe somebody prophetically has spoken into you. Again, don't just say the prophetic, like this isn't our test. It's how are we hearing from the Holy Spirit? How are we hearing from the Lord's voice? Okay. And then just a couple more here is, you could say this is kind of funny, but does it move me? Like, does it actually genuinely get you excited and passionate? Like, ah, oh, yeah, this is, this is good. And then I love this one. Will it stretch me? What you're being asked to do, this man of God has a revelation from the Lord. He has to go tell King Jeroboam this. Ultimately, it led to his death because he was disobedient. But you remember just that first step of releasing the word. Man, now a lot of people get nervous about that. But if you have a word of encouragement, forget the words of knowledge and, and wisdom and prophecy right now. Just say, let's just say God has, says, I want you to go encourage somebody. Could you actually be stretched and, and be radical enough to go bless that person? Number nine, it just says, and I love this one. Will it require faith? I hope so, because without faith, it's impossible to please him. And then the final one is, do I have peace about it? These are ways to confirm the Lord's voice into your life. Does it agree with the Bible? I mean, look through this list and hopefully, Hopefully your process, uh, like you don't go through all 10 and then take five months to make a decision. This list is not to delay your process. It's to affirm and encourage you. Keep on walking and keep on listening to the voice of the Lord. I mean, the reality is, is the man of God heard clearly from the Lord and he knew what the Lord told him to do. He just disobeyed him because he gave in to this old prophet who deceived him. And I would just say, stick to what you hear. Don't add to it. All right, guys, this is 1 Kings 13 and 14. It just keeps on getting more interesting. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks.